When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. You'll notice something about me. I almost never use the phrase church members. Jesus didn't either. He never used that phrase. He wasn't recruiting for a club or a team. He was looking for disciples, people who would be willing to try something, to try living in a way that leads to peace and health for all people, a way of living together in a community. And so I'm going to be perfectly honest, there's this thing, I, I kind of find this actually kind of be a big turnoff when I hear people, church people say, well, we need more members. Because usually, usually if I dig down not too far, um, far, they're looking for more people to give money. And is that how you want to be seen? Because that's not how I will ever look at people in church, as a, a walking donation. Never. In fact, it's kind of messed up if you even equate your value to God or somehow to church with it being associated with your financial worth, because it is not. To quote my favorite band growing up, the God I worship isn't short of cash, mister. Anybody know the band? You too, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I knew, I knew, some, I knew some, some Gen X out there might be able to get that, so good for you. Um, yeah, Jesus' group, they did have funders. There were people that gave money. And they're mentioned. They are mentioned in the scriptures. And Jesus didn't value them any differently because of their money. In fact, here are some quotes from Jesus. Give to those who ask. And don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they might get praise for people, from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. God said to him, fool, tonight you will die. Now, who will get the things you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard things for themselves and aren't rich toward God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. You could go on. Jesus had lots to say, but one thing is absolutely for certain in all of that, that Jesus didn't value people because of their money, and neither should anybody else. I firmly trust, I believe, that if we are to, working together to be a blessing to all people, not just some, but if we are working to be a blessing to all people, each doing our part to reach out to those in need. If we're all doing our part to celebrate the incredible diversity that God has created, then we will have what we need for our ministry together. Jesus traveled through the cities and villages, preaching and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. The twelve were with him, along with some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Herod's servant Cusa, Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. 
So what do you notice about the, the people who are named who have funded Jesus' ministries? What? Did you say it? Women. They're all women. They're the ones who gave out what they had to fund that ministry. Not the 12 male disciples. They're never mentioned. They're mentioned for having watched over the funds, but not having it for funded. That's interesting to me. Together, all of them though, they came together to form a community dedicated to teaching and healing everyone. It didn't matter what nation, what ethnicity, what side on the civil strife that they were on, what gender. Every person was dedicated to doing their part for a ministry that served everyone, no exceptions. Membership was not a thing. Now today, we have $90 million cathedrals that are, that are in our neighborhood. We, in this small church community, we're, we have roughly a, a $500,000 a year budget. That's how much it, we spend to have this church here every year. And we have a newly refurbished building, and that's all good. And there's nothing wrong with that so long as it's bearing fruits. As long as what we do together continues to touch, teach, and heal everyone. I, I, I know the reputation that church has in the world right now. You, you know this too. Church people are judgmental, anti-gay, that's still out there, hypocritical. We're not known for being very Jesus-y. And I, I want to say something, too. This happened on Friday, and I, had, I, I thought, you know, actually, this kind of fits into what we're talking about today. Friday, we've been doing this thing, our after-school hangouts. First two weeks, we had zero kids. And I sat there and thought, this is clearly not going well. And then there were four. On Friday, we got a rush of 15 kids who ran across the street. It was a group of kids that had heard that there were snacks here. They could, there was a warm place <laughs> that they could hang out. Diane, we, and we now have cornhole. So they saw a cornhole. And so they came over. And we, we, we were talking and playing. And I want to tell you a few things about this group that just came, these 15 kids that came over and played with us on Friday. They were a little, they came out, they got the text, and they said, why are you doing this? And I said, the people of this church just want you to have a place to be. Nothing more. They just wanted to have, you have snacks and a place to be because even though you may not know our church, you're important to us. And they were like, okay. Thanks for the snacks. And they ate all the snacks, and they were happy. And then they were cold, so they came inside the social hall. And as they were coming in, you could tell I was nervous. And I overheard one of the kids saying, is this the part where they kidnap us? <laughs> <laughs> and, I overheard, and I said, no, we have zero kidnappings in this building, zero. <laughs> and, um, so, and then one of the kids said, oh, no, this is, this is not that kind of church. I used to race my Pinewood Derby car here when I was a kid. Which, of course, you know, so Corey and I know, these are kids that we've had in this church for the Pinewood Derby for years. So the last time he was here, when he was little, and he was back, and he was telling us, this was an okay, we were, this was okay. One of the kids came in and said, this is the first time I've ever been in a church. One of the other kids came at the very end, and he reached his pocket, and he had these nine, nine dollars, a five and four ones that were crumpled up, and he said, I want to give this to the church. And I, said, and I said, you don't have to. I said, this is here for you. And he said, no, I want to. And I said, okay, well, do you want it to go to like our missions or anything? He said, no, I know you'll do the right things with it. Church. Now, we may not be big. We're a small congregation. Yet, I need to be part of a community that is rooted in something else. A community that's rooted in the core values of Jesus' way of living. And maybe you need to be a, a part of a community like that. Maybe those kids downstairs, they need to be a part of a community like that. They don't even know it yet. So what's that going to look like? like? That's what this series is about, after all. That's what today is about. So I'm going to do my prediction time now for um, that. And I'm going to make a prediction. And I'm going to start kind of dark. Um, I'm going to say that sometime in the decades to come, we, not just this church community, but this world is going to see a catastrophe that is going to come. It's going to make COVID look like a bump. Maybe it's the huge political changes that we see dividing this nation, that those take root and something horrible happens with that. 
Maybe it's the news from this week that when I heard it, my jaw dropped, that climate change it now is unstoppable in the Antarctic, that it is looking at ocean levels may go up between four and six um, feet. Think about every nation that has cities on, their, on the water. The world has never known a mass migration about what we're going to see in this next century. Maybe it's war. Strong concerns about that. But I'm thinking we're in for something big. And in the past, say even when I was I've been watching nature doc, you know, those, those dinosaur documentaries, when an asteroid hits the planet, what survives and thrives has two characteristics, small and adaptable. Meet your early relative, about this long. So this is a little guy named Panto Lambda. And that's how he survived when, the, when an asteroid took out the planet, in little communities that were small and adaptable. That's what survives. Jesus' way of living involves people working together out of compassion and mercy. And that's how we survive. It's together. After the first temple was destroyed years ago, Jews created small communities that would be later be called synagogues. They did that while they were in exile in Babylon, when they were held captive, small and adaptable. They had to be. And then when Jerusalem was destroyed again, and I pray for the last time, the Jews and Christians who survived moved all over the ancient world in something that was called a diaspora, from Spain all the way down into, into India. And they formed small communities, small and adaptable. Now, communities like this one, we may continue to have buildings. If these buildings serve beyond being used just once a week for worship, any church that views its space as a clubhouse will watch itself close. Half the church buildings in Prairie Village that were around when I first came here 14 years ago, half of those church buildings have closed. Some are, have been demolished, turned into parks. Others are awaiting that. So I predict that if this space, when I see that room full of food back there, I see the programs that happen all week, if this place continues to be a mission post on Mission Road, being a place of support and blessing, open to the wider community, then we will have a purpose for decades to come. Now the trend of having fewer people come to a physical place like this for Sunday worship probably going to continue. Smaller groups will continue to meet in person or online to continue the work of teaching and healing. As in the church 2,000 years ago, some communities will have sites, even huge cathedrals will still exist, still exist under the care. It'll go back maybe how it was back in Samuel's day when Eli was given charge of a, a large site where people would come. And just like then, we will minister to those that come, and it won't be just members. And really, it isn't now, honestly. In the last few months, something, I just I was thinking about this, in the last few months alone, I have done more non-member, I don't like that term, but I've done more non-member weddings and funerals in the last six months than I have for people who identify as being part of this church community. Is that a bad thing? I've sometimes wondered, do, do, I, do, I, do I serve a congregation? Or do I serve a parish, an area, where all people who come into that, we have a responsibility we care, to care for? Many of whom don't even regard themselves or identify as Christian. I think the future is going to be less about teaching people the right way to think, you know, the right way to believe, and more about the right way to live and to act in this world, to know ethics and morals that are grounded in Christ's way. And people will continue to do their part to fund ministries that change and save lives, 
Things like the, the meal boxes. This morning I walked in and somebody walked into there and says, I love that we do this. Every, I love that we do this. You look at the lines of food and you think of a hundred households, far more who are than, think, if you think three people in a household, 300 people will sit down on Thanksgiving because we're here. That's good. That's good. Things that will work for emergency disaster relief. We're already starting to take some of our offerings that will be used to release relief efforts in, in Gaza. Housing for all. Access to healing and medical services. It's some of the same things that we do today, but changing and adapting to the world around us. And I believe that church, once again, can be known for extending compassion and mercy into the world. That's how we can be known again. And we won't be known for meaningless squabbles or who people think we hate. And there's this thing that happens. It happens in your personal life or it happens even as a, as a world when something catastrophic happens. You stop worrying about the, the color of the paint and you focus on what truly matters. What saves lives, what preserves life and makes it worth living. If that's how we become known, that will be a very, very good thing. And I think that in 100 years, people won't go to church. They won't do that anymore. And people won't ask, what church do you go to? Because people will know by who you are and how you live that you are church. That you represent that in the world. And I don't think you're going to have all these denominations because that, that, which came in because of all of the differences in belief. Instead, you'll have small groups of people coming together to celebrate with all sorts of thoughts and opinions, but united, united in core values. And I'm going to be honest, I don't think sermons are going to be a thing. I don't. I think, it's, I think there are going to be a lot less sermons, but I think conversations will be very important. It's going to be different. I know that. And I think it's going to be freeing. Free from the ego that leads to division. Free from the pressure of keeping things that don't work anymore going. And free for each of us to decide for ourselves to do our part, to live the days that we have in a way that offers fullness and abundance of life for all people. That's what I see coming. And that's going to be good news. Amen. So I didn't mention music. Personally, I, I think that the distinction between sacred and secular music is going to blur. We started today with a religious hymn that speaks to all who have gone through dangers, toils, and snares. And in going through those things, I found the presence of grace in the world and in people. Now we have a song that calls all of us, religious and not, to do our part to care for one another in this life. Please rise as our choir leads us. <laughs> 